I draft a ton of fantasy football teams and it's no secret to anybody, I make a ton of mistakes. And one of those mistakes that I've made in years past is not identifying that the players that are falling past ADP, typically if there's momentum behind that fall, their quote unquote ADP is actually fake, where you may be thinking you're getting them 10 picks after ADP, so you should take them in this draft and you get them at a value compared to the rest of the fields. But then all of a sudden the next draft you're in, he falls 10 picks. The draft after he falls 15 picks. The draft after he falls another 10 picks. And you see that trend over an entire month. So a lot of these guys we're going to be talking about here have those quote unquote fake ADPs that I'll say they're falling. They'll probably continue to fall through the summer. And you may not want to be drafting them until they finally settle down. Now we're going to go player by player here. Starting off with our first guy to Mario Douglas is the 21st player in terms of falling the furthest in underdog drafts over the past month. He's fallen down seven slots in ADP. I mean, there's not too much to discuss. Just want to be very clear. This is a wide receiver that was better than people were expecting his rookie season. The expectations for Douglas, literally zero. I didn't know his name. I don't think 90% of the field knew his name. He comes out in year one. He plays 14 games. He has 79 targets. He has 561 receiving yards. Now, yes, he doesn't score a touchdown, but New England's a debacle. I mean, obviously one of the worst offenses in the NFL, so you can't blame the guy. But as a 23-year-old rookie, he looks decent, right? Um, the reason he's been falling as of late is one, obviously, you have Jalen Polk going in round two. And what's also interesting is you have Javon Baker rising in these underdog drafts as well. Personally, I would actually rather be drafting to Mario Douglas over Javon Baker. I, I think based off the target volume that we saw him have last season, I'm fine mixing him at the very end if you need another wide receiver. Obviously, in your regular redraft league, you're not interested in any wide receiver that's this deep. But we'll talk about Drake May a little later on because May is falling a ton. Now, Aaron Rodgers has fallen seven slots. And if you are looking at Rodgers, I think that the weapons he should have this year project out to be a much better set of receivers than what you had last season. If y'all remember last year, Aaron Rodgers went over to the Jets and he went, hmm, yeah, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, that's cool. But we have nothing else here. Can I can I bring my guys with me? Can I bring Alan Lazard? Can I bring um, Randall Cobb? Can I just pack up my luggage from Green Bay and all my boys move over to the Jets with us? Last year, um, you had a bunch of bumps for New York. Obviously, we didn't even get to see how Rodgers would have played. Probably wouldn't have been great given the supporting cast. This year looks better. Not only do you still have Brees Hall now fully a year removed from the torn ACL. Not only do you have Garrett Wilson another year older. But you have Mike Williams, yes, coming off a significant injury, but that occurred early in the season. You have Malachi Corley, pretty damn good prospect. So in my mind, you have a better situation for Rodgers going into this next year. If you are looking at Rodgers, it is a difficult spot to project him out. And that if we are looking at all quarterbacks 40 years old or older since the year 2000 with the road of his screener, we've only seen... Drew Brees and Tom Brady put up, and Brett Farr for a sing single season, put up 20 points per game or more at 40 years old or older. So I, I'm assuming Rodgers has the chance to jump into that list. I, I'm fine with him at his ADP, but really you're only drafting Rodgers if you have one of his receivers, of course, for the stack because he has no rushing upside. Going over to Isaiah Likely, Likely's fallen eight slots. We already talked about Rashad Bateman in the skyrocketing video moving up dramatically. With Likely, I'm going to be very simple. I, I only draft him on Lamar builds. Outside of that, I, I don't necessarily think that there's a massive reason why you should draft him. If you're looking at what he did last year at his age, there are some pretty good historical comps. You have like Dallas Goddard, Mark Andrews, Antonio Gates, Zach Ertz. He's a talented guy, but ultimately is a tight end two in an offense that shouldn't have a ton of passing volume to go around. So I'll draft him on Lamar builds, but outside of that, I don't know how excited I am to take Likely. Um, Baker Mayfield's fallen eight slots. If you are looking at Baker here, I was surprised to see if we go through and put his age 28 season in the road of his screener to come up with historical comparisons. Jared Goff in his age 28 season had a very similar season in 2022. And obviously the following year in 2023, Goff had a great year at about 20 points per game. I think that's pretty much best case of what you're looking at here for Baker Mayfield. A lot of these other guys are at about 16 and a half points per game. I think a lot of it comes down to Baker on what you are projecting out for the receivers in this offense. If you think we can get a bounce back from Godwin, if you think that Mike Evans is not going to fall off going into year 10, then by all means, I mean, Baker Mayfield, ADP, uh, QB 21, 
if you took Evans early, if you took Godwin early, it makes sense to go ahead and pull the trigger. But I mean, you have a couple of Buccaneers falling that we're going to talk about in this video. We have Kate Otten a little later on. Um, TJ Hawkins said another tight end that's falling. This is, and we'll talk about Chubb too, but this is a mistake that I think a lot of people, including myself, make. I'm not going to try to exclude myself on this list. I make this very often. When you are looking at these injured guys in fantasy football drafts, whether that's TJ Hawkinson, whether that's Nick Chubb, these guys that, or Jonathan Brooks, these guys that should start off slower at the beginning of the year coming off a significant injury. But the hope is that in weeks 15, 16, 17 for the fantasy playoff tournament on underdog, that they can be league winners, that they can be 100% healthy by the second half of the season. And we can be freaking pumped to have them on our rosters. It's okay to draft that profile under two circumstances. One, we need to make sure that we are getting the right discount. Right, Because if you're drafting Nick Chubb, we'll talk about him in just one second. But if you're taking Nick Chubb as RB34, it's, I don't want to say priced in the injury, but we understand you don't need to go out there and scream, oh, he's injured. Everybody knows he's injured. He's going as RB34. If he was fully healthy, the man would probably be going as RB12, 13, 14. So one, making sure the discount is what it should be. And two, trying to perfect the timing in which you're drafting them. This isn't going to impact you if you're drafting in your regular home league and you're only going to do one fantasy football draft this year, which I would say you probably should get in more than that. But yeah, if you're just waiting until September, it, it doesn't matter. But if you're going to be drafting teams all offseason on underdog like I am, what you're typically going to find are those guys that are injured that may not play week one. Once you get closer to the start of the season, they're going to fall further and further and further down drafts. Because as we get closer to week one, people begin to think more and more about week one, about week two, about week three. So I need to do a better job of these guys like TJ Hawkinson, who if you look at his profile, I mean, a phenomenal range of outcomes this next season. The next year, you had Jimmy Graham at this age, 19 points per game. Zach Ertz, 14 and a half. Antonio Gates, Travis Kelsey, Jason Witt. I mean, you have phenomenal comps here for TJ Hawkinson. It all comes down to the injury. And I'll probably draft a lot of TJ Hawkinson this year, but I think he may continue to fall so you can get him at a better discount later on. Because right now, he's already fallen nine slots and he is going as tight in 14. Um, Kate Otten's fallen. I already talked about Tampa for a bit. I mean, with Otten as a tight end that I don't think it's a super special talent. He hasn't been great, but he's been incredibly young. And if you are expecting Baker to be able to come out here and continue to put up passing volume and maybe some slight regression for Mike Evans with his touchdowns, then Otten does have room to improve going into year three. As tight end 20, I'm fine if you want to mix him in. It's like a uh, tight end three on a three tight end built. Issue is the offense shouldn't be great. Now, going over to Nick Chubb. Now, this is a difficult spot because I'm going to be honest with you. I have found myself taking Nick Chubb with the fake ADP. Going back to what we were talking about previously, in a lot of these drafts in the live stream, I've seen Nick Chubb slide 10 picks past ADP. And I'm going, ooh, um, I, I guess I, I need a running back here. Might as well go ahead and draft Nick Chubb. And then all of a sudden, the next draft, he falls 10 picks past ADP. The next draft, he falls 10 picks past ADP. And then all of a sudden, you begin to realize, yeah, that ADP is not real. He's going to continue to fall in drafts. Very similar to the Hawkinson situation that we were talking about. So two different things I want to mention with this injury. I think this is coming from Draft Sharks or is a, some injury side. But anyway, it's read out. Chubb sustained a season-ending left knee injury during week two versus the Steelers. He underwent surgery on September 29th to repair his MCL and meniscus, a subsequent surgery to repair his ACL was necessary as well. So I want to be very clear. This is not just a clear ACL tear. Everybody and their mom was watching this game on primetime. It was in week two. Of course, everybody was watching it. So first thing is, let's be clear. It was a devastating injury that everybody understands the implications of. Two, it was in week two on September 18th. So the saving grace that you potentially have for Nick Chubb is this is a running back that has had a long time to rehab, will have a very long time to rehab this offseason. If you look at the actions taken by the Cleveland Browns, all they do is throw like 150,000 guaranteed at Deonta Foreman to bring him in, maybe 300,000 guaranteed, but they don't really pay Deonta Foreman anything, give him a one-year deal and bring him in. 
I would be much more concerned about this Nick Chubb injury if they went and drafted Trey Benson. If they went and drafted Jalen Wright. If they went and actually significantly invested into the running back position here, I think I'd be running for the hills. But as it stands right now, like a, a recent draft we did on the live stream, we got Nick Chubb pick 129 and Jerome Ford pick 136. I actually don't mind going through and investing him to him at that price point and just kind of monopolizing the Cleveland backfield if we're specifically chasing weeks 15, 16, 17, trying to find the highest upside we can then. Now, like I said, the issue with these injured guys is they may continue to fall as we get closer to the season. But of course, if you want to draft any of these guys, if you want to hop in a live stream and laugh at me as I draft them, we're drafting every single night on Underdog Fantasy. We've done it every single day for years and years and years. They're best ball drafts, so there's no time commitment at all during the year. It's how I'm able to draft hundreds of teams every offseason. It's how I won 150000 on Underdog two years ago. And, I mean, that's where you should be drafting right now. And if you find that link in the description or the comment section and use code FLOCK, they're going to give you a 50% deposit bonus up to $250. You're going to be getting a special NBA pick -em, depending on the day that you sign up. It's going to be something like Luka Doncic, more than less than half a total point. And on top of that, if you use code FLOCK, you're going to get our 2024 fantasy football rankings. It's available in damn near every state, even available in Michigan now. But moving over to our next slot, we are going to be looking at Josh Jacobs. Jacobs has fallen 11 slots in drafts currently. If you are looking at Jacobs, he goes to a great offense. And not only does he go to a great offense, but at the same time, he gets paid a significant amount of money to do so. We can go through and add on the fact here with Josh Jacobs. This isn't someone that was drafted in 2018 after four years of school at Georgia, like Nick Chubb. He's not a running back going into his age 29 season. Josh Jacobs is going into his age 26 year this year. I mean, he was the youngest running back in the 2019 draft class. So he's younger than a lot of these other veteran RBs. He's in a great offense. He has the contract. There are reasons to be excited about Jacobs. And I'll say as RB11, I'm completely fine drafting him. Like if we're going to go through and if we're going to pull up these underdog rankings uh, where he is going mid round four, there aren't any running backs that are going after him that I'd rather have. It all comes down to your roster construction. Are you okay taking a running back in round four, which in these underdog drafts typically is difficult to do if you go with a running back in round one. And a lot of times I'm trying to get myself an elite level quarterback in this range. A lot of times I'm looking at Josh Allen. A lot of times I'm looking at Lamar Jackson. I'm looking at Patrick Mahomes. But if you didn't want that elite level quarterback, I think it's completely fine to pull the trigger on Jacobs at this new price. And I don't expect Jacobs to continue to fall much further. Um, Keith Mitchell's falling 11 slots. I, I'm going to continue to pass on Keith Mitchell. I don't even know if I'd take him in an underdog draft. I mean, the difference that you'd have with Keaton Mitchell and Nick Chubb, obviously both dealing with season ending injuries last year's one Keaton Mitchell happened near the end of the year Two with Keaton Mitchell. This is a running back that has never proven anything. I, I mean, he was a day three, no pedigree player coming out. Some people got excited because obviously he can be very efficient running alongside Lamar Jackson. He goes out his first game. He has nine carries, 138 rushing yards, and everybody loses their mind. Understandably so. But if we take a step back and look at Keaton Mitchell, he's a running back coming off a severe injury that's buried on his depth chart, that has no pedigree, that has a career high of nine carries in a game. I'm, I'm not interested. I, I probably will not be drafting him this season. I think he's going to continue to fall. I don't know if he's going to be getting drafted in a month. Um, Brock Bowers has fallen 12 slots. I, I don't necessarily know why, to be honest. Maybe his just price was a little too high to begin with. I mean, with Bowers, he's going as tight end 11. I typically, I haven't drafted rookie tight ends heavily, but going back and looking at what happened last year and Sam Laporta putting up the best rookie tight end season of all time, very, very disappointing for my own results. Uh, if you are looking at Bowers, you should have Devontae Adams dominating targets here. You have Myers. It should be a bad offense as well, but super good prospect, right? I mean, he's such a good tight end prospect. He had five rushing touchdowns at Georgia. Incredibly young. Um, I, I love him in Dynasty. Best ball maybe just be a little bit tougher for this year. Uh, J.K. Dobbins has fallen 11 slots. Uh, we talked about Dobbins in this entire Chargers backfield in depth uh, back about like a month ago. And our takeaway was, okay, if we're going to take a shot on anybody here, either take a shot on Gus Edwards or the rookie. As if you were looking at Dobbins coming off a significant injury, 
Um, a running back that has $50,000 guaranteed to his name. So it's difficult to come out and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we know that J.K. Dobbins is going to have a significant role. We know that J.K. Dobbins is going to be great. No, I mean, it is just a straight up projection. This is a running back that is going to be 26. He was drafted in 2020. So, yeah, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. He's going into year five. He's had 1,300 rushing yards in his NFL career. Now, obviously, he's dealt with injuries throughout his entire NFL career, but maybe that's a reason you shouldn't draft them. I'm going over to Braylon Allen. He's fallen 14 slots. Braylon Allen's going to be a guy that's getting drafted in some drafts, getting drafted in uh, maybe not getting drafted in others. If you look at this depth chart for the Jets, this is what concerns me a bit, and this is why we weren't drafting Braylon Allen previously. If Brees Hall were to go down, I don't know if Braylon Allen just steps in as like a viable RB. If Brees Hall goes down, based off this team taking two running backs in this year's draft, based off them taking a running back in last year's draft as well, I think more likely than not, this would be a situation that would turn into a committee. And if that's the case, I don't know how excited you are to draft a running back that is a pure backup that doesn't have the upside to be a three down starter. If the guy in front of him goes down, but I mean, he has the upside. He obviously was the guy at Wisconsin. It just depends on how you project the coaching staff to potentially have used these guys. Okay. Let's go over to AD Mitchell. Another player that I have not liked, still don't like, and still will not draft. Now, if you've been watching our dynasty stuff all off season, you realize why we are saying AD Mitchell Horrible player if he was going to go around one of the NFL drafts. I'll reiterate just in case you weren't watching our Dynasty stuff. While film guys absolutely love him, he has never been hyper productive at the collegiate level. It doesn't matter if it was at Georgia. It doesn't matter if it was at the University of Texas. Hook him horns. I would love to root for the guy. Trust me, last season, I was rooting for him heavily when he was a Longhorn. As a Colt, I don't really care. But if we look at the production profile, a lot of people just want to blame it on, oh, Quinn Ewers is bad. Quinn Ewers is horrible, blah, blah, blah. He would have been great in a different offense. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. But moving over and looking at what we have in terms of his production on the field, even if you want to make the argument that Quinn Ewers was a very bad quarterback, inaccurate, and could not hit A.D. Mitchell, and A.D. Mitchell was consistently getting open, he wasn't drawing targets. In my mind, what we would see if Quinn Ewers was such a bad quarterback that A.D. Mitchell was some freak outlier, that the production profile was god-awful, but he was actually a superb talent, is we would see A.D. Mitchell having a very high target share in this University of Texas offense. However, very low production measures, such as yards per route run, such as yards per team pass attempt. But if you were looking at pretty much all relevant wide receivers in this rookie class, A.D. Mitchell was dead last in yards per route run. We're pulling this data over from flockfantasy.com, the fantasy stock exchange guys. Corey put together a phenomenal wide receiver database, phenomenal wide receiver prospect model. I'm so damn happy that we're able to use this. But going back and looking at wide receivers that were drafted with a fewer yards per route run mark than A.D. Mitchell, You had Jalen Brooks, Ben Skoranek, Russell Gage, D'Angelo Yancey, Braxton Berrios, Josh Palmer, Dylan Cantrell, Mike Woods, Damian Ratley, Jonathan Mingo, Noah Brown, Hunter Renfro, uh, Marcus Valdez-Scantling, Justin Shorter, Jalen Camp, Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin, name looks really good. He's never been higher than the wide receiver 20 in fantasy. He's 29 years old. Um, Ray Ray McLeod, Joe Reed, Freddie Swain, Deshaun Hamilton, Travis Fulgham. Uh, Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, that's one hell of a name. Van Jefferson, Trey Nixon, Bo Melton, Auden Tate, Tyree Cleveland, Frank Darby, Josh Malone, KJ Osborne. The only fantasy relevant guy we've ever seen be this bad in college was Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin played at Ohio State with so many talented receiving options. And Terry McLaurin has never been higher than the wide receiver 20 from a points per game perspective in a PPR format. So I I don't know what the ceiling is with A.D. Mitchell. I think he can come in and maybe be decent for the Indianapolis Colts. And then I think he could potentially just come out, command a safety attention, be a field stretcher, create space underneath for Pittman, create space underneath for downs, create space underneath for the running backs and tight ends. But I don't know if A.D. Mitchell's ever really helping you in fantasy. I would rather draft Xavier Leggett later, to be honest with you. I'm going over to our next 
player. We're going to look at Jonu Smith with Jonu. He's fallen 16 slots. Um, I don't know. I, to be completely honest, I don't even want to talk about Jonu Smith. I have no idea what to do with these round 17, round 18 tight ends. They all look gross. One of them's probably going to be good. Two of them will probably be good. I'll probably mix in a little bit of everybody just because I have no idea who we should be drafting. Um, Justin Fields has fallen 16 slots as well. I think people are beginning to realize, yeah, Justin Fields is not the starting quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. But I do want to reiterate, I would still rather draft Justin Fields over Russell Wilson, even though everybody should understand by now that Russell Wilson is the starter and Justin Fields is a backup. If you wanted to mix in Justin Fields in round 18, if he is going to be drafted at low ownership, I am completely fine drafting him. And the reason being is say you're looking at Russell Wilson versus Justin Fields in round 18. Let's use the hypothetical scenario that you are looking at Russell Wilson with a 75% chance to be the starting quarterback for eight or more games for the Pittsburgh Steelers. It looks very likely. And you are looking at Justin Fields with a 25% chance to be the starting quarterback. Out of that 75% outcome, how many times is Russell Wilson actually going to hit your starting lineup? I have no idea. Um, Russell Wilson doesn't have the rushing upside at this point of his career. He's looked horrible for years now. Not saying it can't happen, but I'm just saying the ceiling's a little bit capped. Where if Justin Fields does start, he's probably going to be very bad from a real life perspective, as we've said for a very long time now. But at the same time, you go back to 2022, Justin Fields had 1,100 rushing yards. He had eight rushing touchdowns. So on the off chance that Justin Fields does start this season, what I know is he's actually going to make a difference for your fantasy football team. So I would rather draft Justin Fields over Russell Wilson, even if Russ is more likely to be the starter there. And I'd be completely fine mixing in Justin Fields as your QB three on an underdog build in a tournament. But going over to our next guy, Malik Washington's fallen 18 slots. I, I don't think we need to talk about him. Don't draft him. You get the Jalen Waddle extension. The main reason why he has been falling, though, is just given the fact that they signed Odell Beckham Jr., right? So all of a sudden he goes from being the wide receiver three to the wide receiver four. Um, Chuba Hubbard's fallen 18 slots as well. I think Hubbard is now maybe a little interesting. If you look at what he did last year at his age and throw it in the road of his screener to come up with an expected range of outcomes, you have Tony Pollard the following year at like 16 and a half points. You have CJ Anderson the following year at 14 and a half. Devin Singletary at 12. I'm okay drafting Chuba Hubbard as RB54 because personally, I'm not really expecting Miles Sanders to be anything this year. If you think Sanders is in the mix, you should not draft Chuba Hubbard. But if the expectation is that Miles Sanders doesn't do anything, then all of a sudden Chuba Hubbard should have a role early on in the season, probably be the starter over Jonathan Brooks. And obviously be the handcuff back for later in the year, just in case anything does happen to Brooks. So I, I'm completely fine drafting him at this new price, unless there's some news regarding Miles Sanders that I don't know about, which if there is, for the love of God, let me know. Now, Troy Franklin will be our next guy here. If you are looking at Troy Franklin, we've said since tournaments dropped, I don't have any interest in taking him. This is now beginning to be a more interesting price point. Wide receiver 72. He's fallen 19 slots. He's fallen a ton. Full transparency from a dynasty perspective. Before the NFL combine, when Troy Franklin was being projected to go round one, round two of the NFL draft, I was in. I was looking at a receiver at Oregon that broke out as a sophomore, dominated as a junior, uh, declaring going into his senior year. I mean, that checks a lot of boxes, especially if he gets the draft capital. Then he shows up to the combine small, not as athletic as we were initially thinking. And uh, you can kind of tell that he falls to day three of the NFL draft. Now, I think a lot of people are just viewing this depth chart and saying, okay, there's nobody there. Troy Franklin's immediately going to be able to step in, blah, blah, blah. I think that this wide receiver room is a little more crowded than people want to give credit to. Marvin Mims will be on this roster and Marvin Mims will be running routes. Cortland Sutton will be on this roster. Cortland Sutton will be running routes. What I don't think people are really focusing in on, which is the question in my mind, is what's the situation with Josh Reynolds? They sign Reynolds this offseason. They give him okay money too. But if Josh Reynolds has a role here, 
I, I, I'm not interested in Troy Franklin, even at wide receiver 72. If you think that Josh Reynolds potentially doesn't make the roster, if you think Josh Reynolds isn't out there playing snaps, running routes, and you think it's just Franklin, yeah, go for it. Go for it. But I don't know. I His previous price was really bad. Now it's okay. It comes down, what do you think, with Josh Reynolds? And, but the issue is the offense is bad, right? I mean, at least if we look at Rasheed Rice, there's a case to be made to draft Rasheed Rice. Going as the wide receiver 47, ADP 82. If we look at the historical comps, obviously at 23 years old, he has a great season. Comps historically to Des Bryant, Terry McLaurin, Dwayne Bowe. The following year, they're at 19, 15, 14 points per game. He's attached to the best quarterback play in the NFL. He's going into year two. We know we want to be betting on wide receivers that were solid options year one. We want to be taking them year two. Now, the issue in what happened with Rasheed Rice, which everybody knows at this point, but he goes out there, has the car incident. We don't need to go any deeper than that. Has the car incident, takes the hit in ADP. People are sitting here going, okay, is he suspended? How long is he suspended? We don't know. And then immediately after, punches the photographer. Apparently lures the photographer into a nightclub. We don't need to go much deeper. But anyway, he has another incident immediately after. Which is sad to say the least. However, if we are talking fantasy football and the only thing we're trying to do is win money on underdog, I am okay now drafting Rasheed Rice after he's fallen 19 slots. There are like three different outcomes that you could see with Rasheed Rice. One, he's suspended for the entire season. The NFL looks into the situation and they go, this is such bad press. We want nothing to do with them. And he's gone for the year. Two, he's suspended for eight or so games, six games, five games, whatever it may be. Or three, and this is, I know it seems like it's not a possibility, but I promise you it is. He does not see any suspension. Yes, idiotic with what he did with the car. A hundred percent. I drive like a grandma on the roads. I always talk about this. I think when people zoom by and trying to make their cars sound fast, it's one of the dumbest things I ever see. But also with that being said, we just saw Jordan Addison get a ticket going like 140 miles an hour. We just saw Chris Olave. The NFL has goaded PR. They know how to sweep things under the rug and they know how to make people forget. So if you're in like a $25 underdog draft where all the money's for pretty much weeks 15, 16, 17, and we're looking at trying to turn $25 into $1.5 million, there is the outside chance he's suspended for the season. There is the outside chance that he's suspended for a large chunk of it. But at this price, I'm completely fine to roll the dice and see what happens. Now, going over to our next guy, we're going to be looking at Michael Wilson. Um, don't want to spend too much time talking on this. He falls 20 slots. It's very clear why this happens. Zay Jones signs. So Michael Wilson goes from being the clear wide receiver two in this offense to all of a sudden, instead, I don't know, maybe he's the wide receiver three. But they get rid of Rondell Moore. They get rid of Hollywood. Clearly, they bring in Harrison. But... I, I'm okay if you wanted to draft Michael Wilson now that he's fallen. I mean, this is a wide receiver that didn't have a great rookie year, but you still have comps like Michael Pittman Jr. who went out and had 13 and a half points per game the following season. I, I, I'm trying to think just there's anything we're talking about here. I, I mean, really, if you have Kyler, I think you can mix them in. Now, going over to the biggest faller that we have seen during the month of May, Drake May. Down now going in the 18th round of underdog drafts. Reports came out. Apparently doesn't look good in camp for whatever that means. For whoever's saying it. I don't really care. Um, Quarterback that has rushing upside. 700 rushing yards two years ago at North Carolina. Nine rushing touchdowns last year at North Carolina. He goes top three in the NFL draft. He should be the starter very early in the season. And while historically this has been a horrendous New England Patriots offense in terms of the weapons they give their quarterback, here may not be as bad now that they go out there and get Jalen Polk, get KJ Osborne, get Javon Baker, have the Mario Douglas. So 
I don't know. I I think we are okay to make sense. Some Drake may round 18. If you completely whiff on quarterbacks, which y'all have seen me in some of these drafts whiff on quarterbacks. And then all of a sudden get stuck with freaking Bryce young. But I, I I'm going to say, I'd probably rather have may over young, but I think that should be it again. Thank you so much for sticking with us. If you enjoyed it, hit that like subscribe. And yeah, of course I would love to draft with you on underdog. We're drafting every single day. You can find that link in the description, in the comment section, code flock. will get you hooked up with a 50% deposit bonus up to $250. Plus, you can get our 2024 fantasy football rankings with code Flock. Plus, you get that special pick em, something like Luka Doncic, more or less than half a total point with code Flock, just depending on whichever day you sign up. But thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Really do appreciate you. Really hope you have a great day. And hope we get to see you out with the live stream later tonight.